and so I've been doing that work research for many, many years as well, and have come to some some significant uh, found wonderful correlations mm -hmm. between the, the heavens and the geography of the Earth is something I've been studying for 32 years as, as well. Yeah. So, so, so there is a, there is also a correlation between your work and the work of Frank Chester. Yes. With uh, yeah, because he he feels that way right. too, that's and uh, of course he can prove it scientifically, which that, is amazing. That's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Frank's work is very profound. Frank came here, and, and uh, we, or maybe it was in the 1990s, and uh, it was very taken immediately by the, by the seals of the, and the, and the capitals mm -hmm. of, of the Gurdjieff that Rudolf Steiner had designed and built, and uh, I had a chance to teach Frank and to work with him, uh -huh. And he was very, very interested, in an amazing man. And Frank is just an incredible genius. I mean, we, you could see it already. He was, yeah. he, he takes an idea and he makes it into a, a it, model. Exactly. And, and, all of a and sudden he tries it, it out. Tries it out. And, yeah. his, and his between the conception and the manifesting it into his hands is very quick. Yeah. One of yeah. the most talented people I've ever seen. And uh, so, yeah. So Frank, Frank Chester was was very stimulated by the work that he was doing with Dennis Klosek and. And also with the, with the star work, he he became very connected, and mm -hmm. he, he actually assisted in some of the workshops that I was giving. He would teach geometry and right. uh, to some of the workshops, the star workshops, while he was here in in town. And he continues to be a dear friend and yeah. colleague. And of course, he just opened the research center. That's right. In uh, La, uh, San Carlos. Yes. Uh, yeah. Which I filmed. Uh, yes, uh, I mean, also for, uh, filmed yesterday the first session. Yes. You what? know, where the planning session on how they're going to go ahead. Yeah. So yeah, it's I very mean, exciting. if it if it hadn't been for Rudolf Steiner College and Dennis Klochik and you and all the others, yeah. he wouldn't be doing this that's, work because right. I think that was the missing piece in his biography. I think. So. So too. You know? So that again, we see a wisdom. <laughs> There's yeah. a wisdom in our in our meeting each other and yeah. interacting, and we yeah. find people along the way who who give us a piece of the puzzle that will exactly. help us continue to work. Yeah. yeah. Maybe you can say something too about the difference between astrology and astrosophy. Well, Elizabeth Rada was the pupil that Rudolf Steiner uh, observed had really a talent for star wisdom. She actually was a mathematician and was was interested in astronomy as well. And uh, so he, Elizabeth Rader was also a remarkable human being. She, he would have to designed a house for her right across from, in, from the Gurdianum, uh, across the little creek there in, Arles, in, in, in Arlesheim. Mm -hmm. He would have to designed a house for her. And um, she would come to the lecture and she would sit in his lectures and she, would just, she would, was incredibly attentive. And then she would walk home, it took her 10, 15 minutes to get home. And then she would write out the entire lecture, beginning to end, from memory, with with no with no flaws. And Rudolfson said about her, uh, he said to her, "You are the only person who's understand who understands everything I am saying." Yeah, yeah. So Elizabeth yeah. Brady was a kind of genius, yeah. an incredible, incredible yeah. individual, incredibly talented person. And so he recognized her genius and and said, "Your child." And so when the mathematical last he. He, he built a section around her and said, you will be the leader of the section for mathemat mathematics, astronomy section. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so uh, she had formulated uh, the idea that astronomy is connected with the body, that this is the way, astronomy is the study of the movements of the bodies of the, of the heavens, that astrology is the study of the soul, how the human soul is related to the soul mm -hmm. of the heavens, mm -hmm. and that the uh, the astrosophy is really connected with the spirit, how, this, how the individual incarnates and excarnates through a series of incarnations, <clears throat> how the spirit of the human being is related to the spirit in the, in the starry worlds, the mm -hmm. spiritual beings in the cosmos, mm -hmm. the hierarchies. So, so, so she formulated that in her writing, this astronomy is the, is the body, the study of the body of the universe, the astrology is the study of the soul of the universe, Astrosophy is a study of the spirit of the universe and its relationship to the human spirit. So it's a very, actually a very direct picture. And um, unfortunately, she also was aware that because of her materialistic attitude toward the earth and toward the sky, we mostly are focused on the body and the physical aspect and the soul. We don't really understand the soul and the spirit. What's that? Unless yeah. without the idea. And of what's the difference between the two? That's right. Yeah. So of course, the the soul is the interaction of the spirit and the body. How the spirit comes into the body. The soul, where the center says, is formed 
-hmm. in the inter interplay between mm -hmm. the, the spirit incarnating into the body. Mm -hmm. So it's, this, it's in this moment of interplay where the soul uh, takes on the characteristics, or well, the human being uses the configuration of the, of the planets, who actually waits to, to incarnate under a particular configuration at birth, which is related to the death, moment of death from a previous incarnation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in a certain sense, if we're looking at astrology, we're usually, a, a, a typical astrologer will look at a birth chart and just read the patterns there and try to understand the soul tendencies, the, the challenges and opportunities mm -hmm. and the struggles and so forth. But really when, when you bring the idea of the spirit into play, then all of a sudden you can begin to say, well, how is this particular birth chart related to the death chart of a previous incarnation? How is it related to the conception chart? And Willie Zucker's work, Willie Zucker became a pupil of Elizabeth Breda and, right. uh, and began and wrote many things under her guidance, mm -hmm. uh, trying to awaken the study of astrosophy. And uh, Willie Zucker's work really pointed to the significance of, of the conception chart in relationship to the birth chart. And what happens between conception and birth is more or less a playing in of the <clears throat> of the plan of the destiny of the human being between conception and birth, between conce this conception chart and the birth chart, those mm -hmm. nine months or ten lunar cycles right. yeah. are actually weaving by the, the human being is weaving spiritual intentions and karmic necessities mm -hmm. into the fabric of the movements of the stars, and therefore at the moment of birth, the birth chart is is not just a single moment. The birth chart is actually the result of this of this 273-day incarnation process. Exactly. And it's, exactly. it's the culmination of a, yeah. of a incredible weaving of yeah. destiny. Yeah. So to begin to understand that is moving from astrology toward astrosophy. How the human spirit is, is, is selecting that particular moment and how the destiny and the karma and the, and the intentions are there. And Robert Powell continued to do that, continues to do that research. And Robert has found that, just as Rita Center had remarked, that the birth chart of an individual is related to the death chart from a former incarnation. Mm -hmm. Robert's research, as he went through and investigated the star charts that Rudolf Steiner indicated of in his books on karmic relationships, his lectures, mm -hmm. Rudolf Steiner named a number of individuals who traced them through sequences of incarnations. So the ones that we have good dates for, yes. Robert Powell was able to then to find that not only is the, the death, the birth chart a reflection of the of the the birth chart a reflection of the previous death chart, but the conception chart is a reflection of the birth chart from a former incarnation as well. Uh -huh. So you go from a birth chart, the birth chart of the former life will show up again in some in way the in the conception chart, and the death chart from a former life shows up in the next birth chart. Uh -huh. So did you start to get this leapfrogging and this interweaving of yeah. destinies? And again, it gives us a sense that the human being is, is a spiritual being working uh, on behalf of the spiritual hierarchies, uh, coming into a situation where we enter into life losing, basically we become blind, deaf, and dumb to the spirit as we yes. incarnate, yeah. but that's, uh, there's a design there. The, the design is that we can become spirit to freedom and love and, and awaken like Parsifal out of pure foolishness and dullness and, and doubt into the capacity to bless and to love and to find our creativity within within this fabric of the of the sense world itself so our task is really to wake up as spiritual beings within within the sense world and it, it's wonderful who was it was it was it chardin who said we are not we're not human beings seeking a spiritual experience we're spiritual beings seeking a human experience exactly so star wisdom is really a kind of a, a further elaboration to come in there idea. how does uh, olive Fitcher's work uh, fit into this it does fit in, but I'm not a student of all of Witcher's work. I wish I knew more about projective geometry yeah. and all of the work that yeah. she's been doing. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, Frank is bringing projective geometry, yes. so you, there's a way in. Uh, maybe you can say something uh, between, like when uh, a little bit more about um, the sidereal way of looking at it and the, the tropical way of looking at the... Yes, for Western astrology... Uh, Robert Powell has done a great deal of research on this, but a number of years ago, there was a man named Cyril Fagan who was uh, Cyril Fagan was an Irish astrologer who was sorting through the the various journals and uh, and the and the British Library and uh, and anyway, he, what he found was look, he came across an article that said there there are these horoscopes, there are these star patterns in the 
uh, from Babylon that, show, that suggest that there was a particular framework of the zodiac that connected it in a certain to particular stars. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, so when Cyril Fagan discovered this, he began to look into it more deeply and he was able to convince a few other people and wrote many books about, uh, wrote a book called Astrological Origins where he came across the idea that the bull's eye, the, uh, the eye of the bull, uh, which, is, uh, which is actually a very bright star in the bull in the constellation of Taurus, that the bull's eye is the center of Taurus and that all the constellations, and that there are 12 constellations and they are 30 degrees of peace. Mm -hmm. Now, tropical astrology uh, was based, is based on the idea that uh, it comes out of the Tetrabiblos, the work of Ptolemy, that in Ptolemy, <coughs> wrote these four, Tetrabiblos means the four books. Mm -hmm. And Ptolemy lived in the second century AD in Alexandria. And Ptolemy had tremendous access to all the, to the library of Alexandria and to the traditions of star wisdom and esoteric wisdom, mystery school wisdom that were gathered there in that wonderful school in Alexandria. And Ptolemy was able to, <coughs> to write these books on astrology but basically he was not a practicing astrologer, mm -hmm. but he, he interviewed different astrologers and, and consulted the text. Mm -hmm. And his question really was, he also did a wonderful picture of the sky, the, the Almagest, the mm -hmm. little book on, on the wisdom of the stars and described the bullseye and the heart of Leo and so forth as, as stars. So Ptolemy's work is really a foundation for astronomy and, and for astrology. In a certain sense, you could say he rescued those ancient sciences for, uh -huh, for modern humanity. To bring them back. But in the, in the book, in the, in the Tetra Biblos, he makes the remark, he asks a question, apparently to some practicing astrologers, where exactly is the boundary between the zodiac? I don't see boundaries. That's, I see stars, but I don't see any clear picture. Yeah. And so uh, he was told, uh, he says, well, if you assume that the sun on the first day of spring is entering Aries, that's pretty close. Mm -hmm. So that's what he wrote into the Tetra Biblos. He mm -hmm. wrote, well, the, the, they say, the astrologers say, that all these uh, diagnostic tools and all these ways of looking at, at astrology, at the birth chart, will only work if you assume that the sun is entering areas on the first day of mm -hmm. spring. Mm -hmm. So that became a kind of a, an underpinning of, of a way to relate to the stars. He had forgotten or he didn't come across a clear description that actually had been given probably 500 BC, yeah. in, uh, in Babylon, uh, defining the zodiac as centered on the bullseye. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so the bullseye is 15 degrees Taurus. You measure 15 degrees to either side of the ecliptic, and there you have the constellation of Taurus, and you go to the next 30 degrees. And earlier you have Aries, later you have Gemini. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, that didn't appear in his work, although he was deep, he wasn't trying to start, he wasn't trying to break free of that idea. No, no. He was, that was, that was the configuration just, of the stars at his exactly, time. Exactly, yeah. But what has happened, of course, was he's, and he was also aware of the procession of the equinoxes, that mm -hmm. the sun on the first day of spring would fall back. Mm -hmm. I, th I think that Ptolemy might have thought that he was writing for his contemporaries. Yeah. But he didn't know yeah. that. Uh, that we would <clears> still take that. That's right. And that his work would gradually find its way. And of course, when uh, in 529, Justinian closes the, all the mystery schools in Athens and, and basically closes off the wisdom of the ancient Greek teachings mm -hmm. uh, that had been existing for 500, for a thousand years and drives out all these teachings, drives them out of Europe, thinks that they're somehow polluting Christianity and throws Europe into a dark age. But all these teachings then go to down into mm -hmm. to Alexandria and Arabia and so forth. But the Arabian astrologers study Ptolemy very deeply and they take up the idea that the sun is Aries on the first day of spring. And so it really comes out of Arabia, the idea of tropical astrology. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so they, they kind of hardened that. So when astrology was reintroduced into Europe in the 13th, through the Crusades and then later through the Renaissance, mm -hmm. it, it was the Arabian <coughs> translations of the work of Ptolemy that found their way back. And with the idea that the sun and the is on the first day of spring, regardless of where you actually see things in the sky, mm -hmm. this is what the master says. Yeah. <clears throat> so tropical astrology, Western astrology became tropical 
based on the vernal point yeah. uh, as the beginning point of Aries, whereas astronomers were very aware that the sun falls back one yes. degree every 72 exactly. years. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So now the sun actually is, 20, in, in 2013, the sun has fallen 25 degrees back from, exactly. from yeah. Aries, and yeah. so the sun 